Okay. Well, welcome to today's session. We're very excited. Um, he is the CEO of Business Coach can really help um, people uh, be more successful in the education arena and in employment. So, Brian, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And my colleague from um, Ireland is joining us as well. No, I, it, and Neil Milken is um, not going to. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Antonio. Uh, in fact, I'm in Lisbon this week. So. Uh, oh, that's right, Portugal. Yes, I'm in Lisbon until the, uh, I'm back to Ireland on, on the 26th. So um, I'm spending uh, two weeks at home, working from home. So and then I'll be back to I will be back to Cork on the twenty sixth. So in Portugal today. Yes. So cool. Yeah. And Neil is not joining us today because he is hosting the W three one of the W three C subcommittee meetings in London. So, um, but he will try to join us tomorrow on as we uh, chat with Brian on our Twitter chat. So, Brian, tell us more about how you got into this work. Well, I got into this work because of my sons. Uh, all three of my boys are on the autism spectrum and have ADHD. And like many parents, especially fathers of these special needs kids, I found out about my own challenges through taking them through all of their diagnostic trials. I learned that I have strong Aspergian tendencies and I also have ADHD and dyslexia, which I went through my entire life undiagnosed until around, I think, between age 37 and 43. Brian, whenever you realized that you had these diagnoses, did it change the way you lived your life, the way you, I know you're a very successful businessman, so um, it, it would appear from the outside looking in that even though you might not have realized it, that you still were having great successes. I was having successes not to the level that I wanted, but the successes were extremely hard won because of how long it took me to do things, because of how many walls I hit. I had plenty of times where I was ready to give up because I just couldn't figure out how to make something work. And then as luck would have it, I would stumble across the right person because I kept asking, how do I do this? What's the way to, to make it work? What have I missed? So I kept myself pursuing the options until I found somebody to help me. And I think it's my persistence and my resourcefulness more than anything that really compelled me to keep going until I got what I wanted in spite of the challenges. But the one way that it's really changed my life to get these labels, terms, diagnoses, whatever you want to call them, is that it really helped me zero in on why things weren't working. And it allowed me to depersonalize it, meaning it's not because I'm dumb, it's not because I'm not trying hard enough, it's because there are these legitimate gaps in my skill set that I can just let go of trying to be an expert there and instead find some kind of an accommodation or find somebody else to partner with so that I can still have the results that I want. Well, that's, that's such an impressive story. And I think that's probably one reason why you are a bestseller author, bestselling author, because your, your story is so unique and as an individual, but also as a father that is walking three sons. I think it's very interesting. You I thought, wow, I got to know this guy. So um, it's very impressive. So tell us a little bit about the coaching aspect of it. I know coaching is becoming very, you know, it's becoming very big thing, business coaching and life coaching, personal coaching. But I, um, I had not heard about coaching 
for people with ADHD and autism. So I was very interested in that. Well, as you know, I, I'm an LCSW in Illinois, meaning licensed clinical social worker. And I had a day job when my oldest son, now 17, was diagnosed. We found out about him right in the midst of first grade. And it was in seeking support for myself that I joined a parent group. And understanding my own Aspergian tendencies, my own scatterbrain, the members of the group quickly found out that I could really help them tap into their child's experience, where their child could not express this for themselves. So the meetings began after a couple of months. They would start out like this. I have a question for Brian. And I became, <laughs> the, go yeah, I became a go the go-to person for their solutions. And when they found out I was a social worker, they said, where's your office? I want to bring my kid to you. And I didn't have an office. I wa that wasn't even on my radar. You know, I was comfortable with the predictability of my day job. So after about a year and a half of more and more parents saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, the, the need is so great, you don't understand how much help you've given us. So after a while, I said, okay, there's nothing to lose here. I'll give it a shot, see what happens. And I found inexpensive office space. I started working part-time. And in four months, working part-time, I replaced my daytime income. So wow. I, scrapped, I scrapped the day job. I jumped all in. And that was about nine years ago. Wow, well, that's amazing. So that, that, was, no, that was obviously a, a, a need in that space. And you know, between, between those days and today, you know, uh, what, what changes? You know, because this is not something that is affecting your area, you know, the place that you are in. Do you see that, you know, that the, 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 the fact that you were able to move into this direction and help other people were able to awake uh, somehow people who were also looking for that, those answers someplace else? Well, they were really looking to each other. Now, keep in mind that this was early 2000s. I don't know when Facebook came on the scene, but I hadn't discovered it yet. So people's resources were really limited to who they knew. It was difficult to go beyond their own circle. So if their circle was struggling, they thought, well, this is it. It's, we're meant to struggle. We're, we're meant to have the school system not support us, and it's us against the world. But now that I've discovered social media, I now have a website, a newsletter. I've, and Deborah, you might have seen this on my Facebook profile. I've created this global community where people come together and help remove that sense of isolation that a lot of parents have. So they know that they're in it together. And that's probably one of the most important things is parents getting empowered by realizing that there's still more that they haven't tried, still more that they can do, that there's always hope for moving their child forward. And that's probably one of the most exciting things that's changed is being able to reach all corners of the world. I mean, De I'm in middle America. Deborah, you're on the East Coast. Antonio, you're in Portugal. And we might as well be in the same room together because of technology. Mm -hmm. It's just so easy to bring resources together these days that it's very difficult for people not to get the support they need. And, uh, and are you getting, uh, let's say, uh, people asking you to say, I'm having this, this problem you know, in my school or in, at work. Uh, how can you help me? Uh, I get questions all over the world with that question. And one of the first things that I, I go after is how empowered is this parent? Because some parents will come to me and say, I've tried everything. Well, if you tried everything, that mindset tells me that this person feels helpless. They believe there are no more options. So the one thing I want to accomplish with them right off the bat is tell me what you've done that hasn't worked. So I don't tell them things that they already know. And then I immediately get into, if you had the perfect solution, what would it look like? What resources do you need? Is there anybody around you who's an expert at this, who can come to the meeting with you? 
Because one thing, and I'm sure that you, you've seen this, Deborah, is people will talk themselves out of asking for help because they think they're being a burden. So yeah. they'll assume that the help is not available and they will make themselves helpless. But once they realize that they have these people in their network and they reach out, they're pleasantly surprised by how willing people are to step up. So sometimes it's just helping them get past that helplessness that can open up a new list of possibilities that can give them all the help they wanted. And they really didn't get anything from me. I just facilitated getting their mind open again. Which is very impressive. Brian, how, how, uh, and, and maybe you haven't, but how few people were working? You know, maybe a person with ADHD or autism that were in the workforce that were struggling, struggling it. And I'll give you an, an example. Um, I uh, created a company, Tech Access, and I had many employees with disabilities working for me. And I had a um, a man working for me, um, and he had um, he had Asperger's and he had an anxiety disorder. And so he he was a great employee. He was brilliant, but. Uh, one day he came in the office and he started being very disruptive. He started uh, cursing and saying any inappropriate uh, sexual things to some of the female co-workers. And he, he, to me, he sort of went off, you know, he, he, you know, he, he became a big problem. And I wanted this young man to be successful. And I, but I wasn't even, even though I'm a quote expert, which is, to, I don't know if anybody's an expert, we're all figuring this out, but he just, he became this huge problem out of nowhere. And, and I didn't even wear, I mentioned to um, some of the therapists and some of the people that had, the, the service providers that had brought uh, different employees with disabilities to me. And they said, Deborah, don't you know that's what we're here to help you with? You don't have to, as the employer, struggle with this by yourself. Let us step in and help him be successful. The worst thing that could happen is that he gets fired over these behaviors. So they stepped in, the experts, the clinical psychologists and the service providers, and it turned out that his roommate had talked him out of, talked him into going off his meds because the meds don't make, they make you not think and, and you're not cool if you're on meds and stuff like that. So they were able to talk him into go, getting back onto his meds and, um, and, and he, you know, um, he took just like a week or, or maybe two weeks off from work, got everything reset and came back and he was a wonderful employee that I had had for many years and he wound up staying with me for many years too. But I sometimes thought, well, I disability guard I've learned a lot more since then but uh, I'm just curious you know just having experienced something like that myself as an employer um, if you have any words of wisdom for us well I work with many clients in that situation uh, women men with either ADHD or or Asperger's and the one thing that I like to use is the framework of keep, start, and stop. So in order to make a situation work, you need to ask yourself, is there something you need to keep doing, stop doing, or start doing? So when you look at the, the gentleman that you were referring to, is, okay, is there something that you had been doing that you stopped doing? Because you were able to, to cope just beautifully, and now all of a sudden it seems like you're falling apart. What's changed? Or if things are working, you ask yourselves, what are we doing that's helping and be successful because we want to keep doing it? If there's certain words to approach him with, if there's certain breaks, a certain department that he works in. So just always balancing and measuring things against those three criteria can really help you be more cognizant of the parameters that this person's operating under so you know what you need to, to pay attention to. And you know what's very interesting about that uh, is
could benefit life situation. And if we look at an employee's, it's just a really simple but so strongly effective way of looking at things. What was working? Well, something something's different. So, um, yeah, that's exactly what we did. I just didn't know to call it so succinctly like that. And keeping it simple is essential because if anybody, especially the client, has to work with too many variables, it becomes overwhelming and they simply can't use that tool. So the more simple you make it, the more accessible it is for everyone. Those are really wise words. Antonio, do you want to ask another question? Uh, no, uh, the, the workplace is a, no, it's a very competitive uh, area, so uh, what type of work are you doing in order to be able to help people when they need to apply for a job or let's say how can you help people like you know working in human resources and recruitment to help people to be more successful when they apply for jobs? That's an excellent question. One thing that I coach my clients through is utilizing their resume as that, though it were a marketing document and not just a bullet point list of facts because somebody out there who doesn't have disabilities are having a hard time finding a job. There's just so many applications per one job. So they need to demonstrate in their resume and especially with a cover letter that them being interviewed and ideally hired will add so much value for their employer that they'd essentially be making a big mistake if they didn't talk to this person. Because if it's just the same, I went to school here and I've had this experience, it's going to be so easy to pass over. You know, it's a dime a dozen. Then once they do get the interview, I spend a lot of time coaching them on where their attention needs to be. Because if they're thinking, I hope I don't mess up, I hope that they like me, they're going to be so nervous they get tongue-tied and they can't effectively answer a question. So what I coach them to do is to make a point of letting, helping the interviewer feel taken care of, helping the interviewer feel listened to, so that their attention is away from themselves and on the interviewer, so they're much better able to relax and put their thoughts together because they're not there to perform anymore they're there to support and that shift makes a big difference in their confidence and their comfort level yeah, yeah I, I um, once again as an employer I would have employees with disabilities that would come to me and I would ask them questions about their resume and I had um, several times employees with disabilities, and these were employees with intellectual disabilities, say, well, I don't know. I didn't write it. Um, you don't have to ask my job coach. Well, I'm not hiring your job coach. I'm hiring you. So I could tell that maybe they hadn't been coached and they weren't prepared. Um, I even had um, one man that was working with me. His So I'm going to call him up and tell him. And my husband said, yeah. And then I'm going to talk to a lawyer and divorce you first. You know, I don't think I like the way your boss is treating you because we, you don't do that in business. Your mom doesn't call and yell at your boss. Your wife doesn't. You know, so it's really the thing that I always try to tell employers is that it, it really is okay to treat employees with disabilities or candidates with disabilities like everyone else. But with certain types of disabilities, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with having some compassion and trying to dig in, make sure people are comfortable. I, I, I just think the role that you play and people like you play, Brian, they're, they're so critical to the success of these employees, both in getting employed and staying employed. Yeah, I've seen job coaches that rescue a lot, like you described. They, they do the whole resume because... A lot of them, frankly, have not gotten the training that they need to adequately support their clients with either Asperger's or ADHD or some other challenge. And one paradigm shift that needs to happen, whether it's a director of HR, whoever's doing the interview or the job coach, is that 
you are helping support this person with disabilities to create an inter interdependence with a support community, but they are still at the helm of the ship. There's so many examples of this. You have the captain of a sailing vessel. Yeah, they're steering it, but they're shouting out requests and commands to everybody around them. They're not doing it by themselves. It's an interdependent activity, just like any kind of work environment. Each person has their job, and the better they do it, the better everybody else can do their job. So no matter how independent they think they are, they are intricately interdependent amongst everybody else. So teaching the person with disabilities to utilize their job coach, their parents, their peers to help inform their decision instead of doing their thinking for them, that's what self-determination is. They still make the final call as much as they can, but there's nothing wrong with collecting wisdom from the people in your community. Well said, well said. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we have been talking about the, those who are, who are applying for jobs, but uh, let's say if, if you are a recruiter and let's say you just finished university, you are, this is, you, you are applying and you are working for the first time in the recruitment process, do you think that you know, new recruiters, uh, how sensible are they for this type of new hires? Uh, are they... Uh, uh, do they do you think that they receive any type of training? Is something that they need to develop and maybe connect to networks like yours? What they should be doing in order to understand their recruiters a lot better? Yeah, re recruiters aren't taught that. They're taught to look for the typical person. But anybody that's doing the hiring really needs to look more and more in terms of specialization. Is yeah, this person may seem quirky. Yeah, maybe they're not the water cooler type, but can this person show up and by doing their job provide value for the employer? If that's the case, then they could be a good fit in that realm. The other question a recruiter needs to ask themselves is, is this company culture going to support this person's differences? Or is it going to be hyper competitive? Is it very catty? You know, is there a lot of gossip going on? If there's a lot of social politics, the person with disabilities is going to be eaten alive. But if it's a very inclusive environment that's much more family-oriented, there is that greater sense of we're all in it together, that's a situation where somebody with disabilities can thrive. So you have to consider the specialization of the, the person being interviewed as well as the, the corporate culture. That needs to be a good fit. And that is that's such a good point, Brian. And and we're seeing more. Some are really ability waking up market value, and they're doing that for a whole bunch of different reasons: legislation, litigation. Um, I talk about this topic a lot, and we're seeing and some employers. That includes people with this all about the individuals, but some individuals are really understanding that, once again, by hiring a diverse workforce, the innovation that you can adds major value to the bottom line. Uh, Microsoft just made an announcement. They are specifically going to be employing people with autism. And um, it, I think something is happening. You know, I, I think that a lot of employers are understanding that um, you know maybe maybe there's a way to do this and we all win. I I remember one time I was being interviewed by a reporter and the reporter said, "Well, tell me how you're accommodating your employees." And I understood what she was asking me. She was asking me what did I do to accommodate my employees that were blind and deaf and quadriplegia and things like that. But I answered her differently, and I said, well, I'll, I try to accommodate all of my employees. I had an employee that just, um, his wife just had the first bit, her first, their first baby. So I knew that that household wasn't going to be getting a lot of sleep, for example. And another
I think we lost Deborah on the connection. Yeah, yeah the, the connection froze up again. Yes, uh, she's on. Uh, she's on a, a satellite connection. Okay. That's yeah, depend depending on the weather, satellite can be very glitchy. Yeah. So, but one one thing I can absolutely say about you know Microsoft making that announcement, Walgreens absolutely led the way. When they built an entire distribution center, I think it was in South Carolina, around accommodating people with disabilities to make them a significant part of their workforce. And others like Microsoft followed suit. And in many ways, these movements and corporations began with somebody in upper level management who had a child with special needs, saying, we can do more to accommodate my son, my daughter, or people like them. And another factor that's really important in this is because there's so much information so readily available, you have to be willfully ignorant to not know what's going out there in the world. You have to choose to disconnect. And companies like Microsoft, Walgreens, anyone else, now has direct access to finding out who is their customer. So a lot of people in the special needs community are talking about places they don't have accessibility. You know, places where they're having a hard time reaching customer service because there's not a, a line for somebody that's deaf to call it. Or the website is not accessible for somebody who has dyslexia. So all of this, this community is coming together and saying, we want your company to be more accepting of us, including us, and accessible to us. And the corporations are feeling the pressure, and they're also getting educated on just what this, these populations can bring to their workforce, to the quality of their brand. And they're wising up to the fact that our community, our customer base is made up of all of these different cultures, all of these different factors of society. They need to also be represented in our workforce. And that's an incredibly exciting shift to see happening. No, because that will also allow them to have a better understanding of their community and the, the society that, that they are in. That will allow them to be more connected. And Abs absolutely. Imagine how much better their products can become, especially if you're talking about a software company. Is if you had somebody on your work staff that has a specific disability, they could be involved in creating that product, saying, you know, can you use this? Is there any kind of issue with this? I don't know this for a fact, but I'm convinced that a lot of the people coming up with apps and the technology that Apple puts out there, they've got to be on the spectrum. Because some of the problems that are solved, I don't imagine would be invented by people who complete these tasks with ease. You know, because so many of these technologies are closing the gaps of learning disabilities. You know, finding, being introduced to Macs and all of the stuff that are just present as part of their operating system has been life-changing for me. I agree. Uh, and I'll give a shout out to Disney. Disney uh, doesn't have employees. They have cast members. They don't have customers. They have guests. And Disney thinks it's very important that their cast members look like their guests. And so they employ people that are in wheelchairs or blind or older or Latino or uh, Asian or, you know, because they want their cast members to look like their guests because they understand the value to their services and, and their products. And so that's a lot. I think Disney's done a great job, you know, on this. And they, like everybody else, they have more that they can do because we're all learning together. But it, the, I think the times are very exciting. And I agree with something you said, Brian, um, before Skype kicked me off again. But, um, you have to really have your head stuck in the sand to not know this is happening. There's so many, being too, way too many resources. We, uh, I know that we've taken a lot of your time, Brian. And Antonio, do you want to ask? No, uh, I, I would like to ask Brian if, if he has any sort of, uh, 
I would like to, act, to ask Brian if he has any sort of statistics or elements that he, can, he could share with us uh, just as an, an, an anticipation for tomorrow uh, Twitter chat. Well, the one statistic that comes to mind is the fact that 80% or more people with disabilities are unemployed. So as much as we have these victories to celebrate of all these companies that are coming forth with a much more enlightened perspective, we still have got a huge amount of work to do. So we can't sit back on our laurels just because we make a little bit of progress. We can celebrate it. It tells us we're moving in the right direction, but we've got to keep pushing and harder so that as many of our community members that want to work and are able to work have the opportunity to do, to do so. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Brian. And uh, we, we, we are counting with you for tomorrow uh, access chat. So um, if you are listening to us uh, today, you, you can just join us tomorrow at uh, 8 London time. And we look forward to have this uh, conversation with Brian. So I'm closing the call now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. And see you all thank again you. tomorrow. Thank you, Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.